Thank you so much, and thank you, Pastor Darrell. What an incredible opportunity this is to be here with you today. I will tell you, on behalf of my wife and I, we are uh, unbelievably humbled and blessed to be here. Pastor Darrell said a few moments ago, he talked about our, our roots in Oklahoma, and uh, really I could talk about a lot of things I don't have time to talk about. But our call to ministry really is anchored in an altar at Turner Falls about uh, 53 years ago. And uh, out of that, everything, everything in our lives anchors back to that altar call that night where my wife received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and God took me to a place of surrender that literally has set the stage for everything. Three years later, 50 years ago this year, I actually found this in some things in our house a few days ago. I received my very first credential card 50 years ago in Oklahoma. I have it with me. I showed it to Frank Cargill a few moments ago. He said, I have one that looks a lot like that. <laughs> so it is just an honor to be able to come home, to be here. Uh, you have, I'm just telling you, over the years, God has blessed Oklahoma with outstanding leadership in every generation, and uh, we had the joy. We came in last year, actually, uh, only the second time in 47 years, but we wanted to come back and be here for Brother and Sister Cargill and their, their finale there and got to be here when uh, Daryl and Faith were elected as your new superintendents. Little did we have a clue that we would be back here this year, but what an honor. Thank you, Pastor Daryl. We appreciate it so very much. I know the ladies were hustling back over here from their luncheon, but I want you to know who my wife is. Becky, would you stand right here on the front, <coughs> front row? This is my wife from Tishomingo, Oklahoma. So uh, it's really good to be here. Wow, what a service this morning. Whoa, I don't know what you came expecting, but uh, I think that was just for me. And uh, I'm glad that you got to listen in as well. But what a, what a powerful, powerful time this morning. And uh, for this afternoon, for our time together, I, uh, I really want to, I want to focus my thoughts around a single word, and that word is next. Next. Obviously, I don't know what's going on in your world today. I don't know the crisis. I don't know what you left at home. I don't know how you're feeling. I don't know the circumstances that are around you, but I have absolutely no question that in this district council, this morning, this afternoon, tonight, tomorrow, throughout, God wants to meet us here. God wants to meet you right where you are, and God wants to talk to us for these moments this afternoon about the simple word, next. I like the word next. I really do. There's a lot that I like about that word. As a matter of fact, for the last several weeks, we've been talking, Becky and I have been talking about the fact that next month we get to be in Oklahoma for the district council. And, and uh, next week, last week we were saying that next week we get to see some great friends from Oklahoma. And now here we are. Becky and I, as of today, have been married for 18,232 days. Yeah, and next month we will celebrate our 50th anniversary, just 30 days from now, which will be 18,362 days. Next week, we will be in Hawaii celebrating our 50th anniversary. <laughs> celebrating it a little bit early because you never know what's gonna happen next. <laughs> I have a question for you though. Have you ever had a next that you were really planning for? you were dreaming for, you were looking forward to it, and then it got hijacked? Has it ever happened in your life? Or maybe you've, maybe you've been robbed. Someone broke into your home or broke into your car and stole some things from you, and all of a sudden, those things that you had are now gone. That next that you had planned is gone. I was listening to a podcast by Judah Smith a few days ago, and he talked about a time when he and his family went away for a family vacation. They had a great time, and as they returned home, they opened the door to walk into their home and realized that while they were gone, someone had broke into their home and, and robbed their family. 
And he talked about the shock and the disappointment, the feelings of being violated, thing of being taken advantage of. Has your next ever been stolen from you? Sooner or later, I think we all experience this to some degree, but I think, uh, I think we've all experienced this in the last couple of years as uh, we've been somewhat victimized by an uninvited guest called COVID-19. We weren't looking for it, we weren't planning on it, but it just showed up in our world. And I want you to think for just a moment about how that all of this has impacted our next how it's changed our planning, it's changed our thoughts about the future, it's changed our emotions, it's taken us on some roller coaster experiences. Some of us don't even know how to dream anymore. We don't know exactly how to plan in our world today. Think back for just a moment to January 2020. What were you thinking about as you were entering into this brand new year, this brand new decade, your dreams, your plans, your, your personal plans for the year, the plans for your church, your 2020 vision, all the whiteboarding and the planning and the design and everything that was happening. And then COVID-19 showed up and it just blew it all to pieces. And we've been navigating in our world having been am- impacted by that. Some of you had children or grandchildren or close friends that were graduating in 2020 and all of a sudden were introduced to virtual graduations. Wasn't that fun? Or maybe, maybe you were planning on getting married in 2020. We have one of our pastors in New Mexico that he and his fiance had all these plans. The date circled on the calendar in September of 2020 and, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden none of their plans will work. And by the way, we're not just talking about the impact of COVID-19. Things happen. Things happen. What do you do when the doctor's report hijacks your next? How do you respond when there's a crisis in your family? Something all of a sudden happens in your family or your household. Or maybe it's in your church and all of a sudden the, the next, the plans, the dreams of the future that you had planned are they're gone. I remember as a 12-year-old preacher's kid, being in the household of, of my parents when one year it came time for the annual business meeting. My youngest brother was very sick that day, and my mom said to my dad, honey, I'm going to have to stay home tonight, take care of, the, of, of the, the baby, and I'll just keep the kids here. You go take care of the business meeting, and we'll see you in a little while. And, you know, my dad kissed my mom and walked out the door with, with all kinds of plans and dreams and ambitions and exciting things in their mind. And he walked back in a couple of hours later to inform us that at that business meeting, he had been, he had been uh, voted out of the church. Hopefully that hasn't happened in your life, but I remember all of a sudden, even as a 12-year-old child, our next was all of a sudden gone. What do you do when your next is hijacked? I want you to think about that. Brian Jarrett took us on a journey this morning that was an incredible journey, but I want you to, I want you to think, about, think about the fact that next is about tomorrow. It's about what's ahead. It's about what's planned. It's dreams becoming reality. And then things happen and next is gone. But I believe for these moments that God has us gathered here this afternoon, God wants to talk to you and he wants to talk to me about next in a world where that perhaps next is a really big question about it. I want you to think about this, though, because since the beginning of time, next has always been a significant part of the equation. It's part of God's plan. It's part of God's design. Even when we can't see next, God has it in his hands. Genesis 1.1. Think about this. In the beginning, God created. I love that picture already. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters. Aren't you glad the story didn't end there? That's an incredible story. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, but the earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters. It was dark, but God wasn't finished. 
It was formless, but God wasn't finished. And I love the way the next verse starts out. And the spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. I have a sense in my spirit this afternoon that the spirit of God is hovering over this place over everything that's transpiring in your life, everything that's going on, every dark cloud, whatever the circumstances are, the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. And then God said, let there be light. And there was light. It's really simple and yet profound, but the light was the next that didn't even exist in the formless, empty, dark world that God had created. And next has been the story since the beginning of time. You think about it as we read the Bible or reflect on history or even look back over our shoulders in our own lives. Yes, we have the advantage of of seeing the crisis, whether it's a a 9-11 memory or maybe a, a horrible tornado that rips through Oklahoma and the disaster and the devastation and the hopelessness. But As we look back, we also know the rest of the story and the the next, the sunrise that gives birth to the next. And we love the stories of next. We love to preach about the stories of next because they build the faith in other individuals to understand that God is the God of next. Remember the story of the little widow in 1 Kings 17. You know the story well, but as we drop in on this little widow woman, here she is with just a little bit of meal in her, in her hand and, and a little oil in this cruise. And, and here she is, she's at, at the end of herself and she's out gathering sticks to build a fire and prepare one final meal for her and her son so they could eat the meal and then die. But what she did not know was that the prophet had come to deliver a message about next. Or we could talk about the story of the Red Sea and the Israelites when they've been delivered from bondage and it's a wonderful, wonderful thing only to find themselves with Pharaoh and his army coming after them and the Red Sea before them and it's hopeless. You've been there and I've been there. No place to turn, nothing I can do. It was hopeless, it was over. But then there was a next or the story of Daniel So many stories we could tell. They throw him into the lion's den. I could hear the clanging of the door as they they close the door on that lion's den and it is over. There is no hope. There is not a future for this. But God knew that there was a next or the story of Jesus whose earthly ministry ultimately takes him to a place called Golgotha, the cross, the crucifixion, his death, it is finished. The darkness, the the sun stops shining. Jesus is in a tomb. The tomb is sealed. But thank God we just celebrated it a few days ago and we still celebrate it today because there was a next as the Spirit of God was hovering over the current circumstances and the resurrection became a reality. I want you to consider this this afternoon because I recognize that next in so many of our lives today looks a bit ominous as we try to look to the future from where we are. Our world is in chaos in every sense of the word, but but in our own personal lives, we're still having to navigate. We are navigating a lot of things. I don't know how it is in Oklahoma, but I can tell you in New Mexico that we've got pastors all across New Mexico that that people walked out uh, when cl- churches were closed a couple of years ago uh, and all of a sudden pastors are still looking looking around 2 years plus later and some of their core people who were there some of their best friends some of their best workers they still haven't come back to church and pastors are having to navigate they're having to deal with that uh, they, these were friends these were partners in, in ministry uh, and and they're dealing with that uh, people not coming back to church and not only that but but ministers who are coming to the place and saying i've had it with this i'm done let's get real it's not easy to be in ministry today i said this to the presbytery last night but i I shared this in in our office, uh, uh, it's been a number of months ago, but I really do believe apart from the call of God, this is a pretty unenviable time to be in leadership. Apart from the call of God. 
I love uh, our friends, Jim Fuller and uh, Pastoral Care here from Oklahoma. And uh, these guys do such a phenomenal job. And, and uh, thank you, by the way, for being will willing to share them with us in New Mexico. But there's some pretty sobering statistics on their website, one of which is to remind us that every single month across America, depending what statistics you happen to be reading, 15 to 1,700 ministers a month are walking away from ministry and saying, I'm not doing this anymore. I read the Barna research that no doubt many of you have read as well recently that said that data collected from their research indicated that U.S. pastors are currently in crisis and at risk of burnout. And notably in 2021 alone, there's been a dramatic increase in the number of pastors who are thinking about quitting the ministry altogether. Specifically, 38% in 2021. 38% of pastors in America have thought about quitting the ministry altogether. I'm not talking about the Monday morning blues. I'm not talking about just having a bad day. I'm talking about seriously considering quitting. If you read a little further in that article, it, it really comes close to home because it said that 46% of pastors under the age of 45 are thinking about quitting the ministry. That's a, that's a younger generation. That's, that, that's the generation we're counting on for tomorrow. And 51% of pastors in mainline churches, this is getting really too close to home. I don't know where you see yourself this afternoon, but across the country and around the world, this is real. We're talking about reality. I know we come to district council and we greet one another. Hi, how are you? I'm fine. How are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. You're fine. The whole world is fine while the whole world is falling around us. We got to get real. I heard Christine Kane talking about this recently in a podcast. And she talked about attacks that she was dealing with and the ne negativity and the polarization and the criticisms and the attacks. And she talked about her personally coming under a, a severe attack over the last couple of years. And she said she came to the place where she personally felt like quitting. And as she described how she wrestled with it, this really struck my heart as I heard her say, uh, I've been through a lot. I've had a, I haven't had an easy uh, past in my own life. I've gone, I've gone through some really tough times. Uh, and she said to herself, I'm tough enough to tough this out. But do I want to? Do I want to? So let's get real. Think about next in our world today for you, for your church, for your ministry, for your world, for your calling, for your life. We know what yesterday looks like and we call that history. We know like to, what today looks like and we call that, well, how would you describe your current reality? What about next? Can I just invite you into my world as God has been taking me on this journey for the last several weeks and as I've been navigating through some of this myself, he took me to Ezekiel 37. You know what's happening in Ezekiel 37. But in the chapters leading up to this, God has been speaking powerfully to Ezekiel with some strong words, not only for Ezekiel, not only for Israel's enemies, but for God's people. And there's a phrase that, that appears over and over again as God is speaking. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Friends, I would suggest to us this afternoon that we need to, we need to hear God speaking to us today. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Don't ever forget this. God has the next word and God has the final word. Whatever's going on in your life, whatever is in front of you, wherever you are, however you feel, God has the next word and God has the final word. God was saying that to Ezekiel then and he's speaking this to us this afternoon. It was God who spoke into the formless, emptiness, darkness in the beginning and it was God who spoke into the hopelessness in Ezekiel 36 with words of hope. I love Ezekiel 36. I mean, it's like the sun begins to rise and there are words of hope. Listen to these. God says, this is what the sovereign Lord says, I'm bringing you back. How many of you know that's a good word when you've been out in the wilderness? 
I'm bringing you back. I'm, I'm bringing you from wherever you are. I'm reaching out and I am bringing you back. He says, I'll give you a new heart. I'll put a new spirit within you. That's a supernatural thing that only God can do. You'll be my people. I'll be your God. I don't know about you, but I read scripture and I, my, my visualization in my own mind, I envision this and I can just see the Father God reaching out, wrapping his arms around us, drawing us into himself saying, Let, I, I want you to be my son, my daughter. I wanna be your father. I, I, that's the relationship that I wanna have. He says in Ezekiel 36, I will give you great harvest. That is a great word. If, it, if we're not careful, we'll read that word. And we're, you know, we're not really thinking about it ourselves, but, but I want you to think what God is speaking here because he's saying those fields that have been barren and dry for way too long, I'm getting ready to do a supernatural work in the midst of that. And I am going to turn those dry, barren lands into incredible harvest. Are you sensing what God is saying? He's saying, you keep reading, he's saying, I'm ready to hear Israel's prayer. I don't know about you, but there've been some times in my life that it felt like my prayers were just bouncing off the ceiling. And I needed to hear God say to me, Mike Dickinson, I am ready to hear your prayers. That's what God is saying in Ezekiel 36. He says, the ruined cities, those cities where the, that have been broken down, they're just in shambles. They're going to be crowded with people once more and everyone will know that I am the Lord. If I'm Ezekiel, I'm starting to feel better. I'm beginning to pick up on the, on the, the spirit of everything that God is saying here. And I, I'm saying, God, I, I can't wait. Come on, Lord, I am ready for this to become reality. And then, then, Ezekiel 37, the Lord took hold of me. In the backdrop of all these promises, the Lord took hold of me and I was carried away by the spirit of the Lord. Now, if I'm in Ezekiel's shoes on the, on the heels of all these promises, uh, the spirit of the Lord picks me up and I'm carried away and I'm thinking, Lord, this is gonna be fun. I can't wait, God, where are you taking me in the, in the backdrop of every promise that you've been saying to me and it says, the Lord took hold of me. I was carried away by the spirit of the Lord to a valley filled with bones. What? What's going on here, God? Am I the only one that ever asked that question? Are you serious, God? In the midst of all that God was, go that, that God was, was doing, in the midst of everything that was going on with God's people, God was speaking to the prophet Ezekiel about next, but his current reality was a valley full of dead, dry bones. I wanna declare something over you this afternoon. You need to get this into your spirit because your current reality does not define your next. Let that soak into your spirit, your current reality there's some current realities in this room that are not good. But your current reality does not define your next. And out of that, God asks Ezekiel a question. Can these bones become living people again? <laughs> Why are you asking me, God? I, 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 don't have, I don't have the answer to this. You're asking me a question. I don't even know what's going on here. You know the story and I know the story, but for the next few moments, can we just kind of take a field trip in Ezekiel 37? Think about what's going on. First of all, I see the prophet's dilemma. <laughs> he's got a dilemma here as he's in this valley full of dry bones. You know what a dilemma is. Well, a dilemma is like a, a, a situation. Sometimes we have trouble even defining what it is, but I checked out the dictionary definition of dilemma. It's pretty interesting. It says it's, it's a situation, a perplexing situation, as a matter of fact, requiring a choice between equally undesirable alternatives. Wow, that's an ugly place to be. Ezekiel looks to his right and there's bones. He said, I don't want to go there. He looks to his left and there's bones. He looks behind him and there's bones. He looks in front of him, there's bones. And out of that dilemma comes a heart of desperation. 
a heart of desperation. If we're not careful, the dilemmas of our lives can create hopelessness. But they're not designed to create hopelessness. They're designed to create desperation. And out of that desperation, the prophet Ezekiel says, God, you alone know the answer to this. And he's recognizing, he's humbling himself before God, basically saying, God, I don't have the answers for this. I think we have to come to grips with the fact that there are a lot of things that we're facing. We don't have the solution. I can't fix this. Uh, There's not a tool in my toolbox that can fix this, God. Uh, A new coat of paint won't make this better. New carpet on the floor won't make this better. A new sound system won't make this better. Uh, A new pastor won't make this better. We're at the end of ourselves, an utter declared dependence upon God. And out of that desperation, God spoke and the prophet heard God. There's a connection between our utter dependence and hearing the voice of God. God, I need to hear your voice. The problem's not an absence of God. The problem is that so often we simply don't hear what God would have to say to us. The prophet's dilemma Out of that dilemma, I see the prophet's call. The prophet's call. God calling Ezekiel and Ezekiel's assignment. Then he said to me, speak a prophetic message to these bones and say, dry bones, listen to the word of the Lord. Ezekiel, I want you to preach to these dry bones. I want you to speak prophetically to these dry bones. What does God have to say to dry bones? What does God have to say to what's going on? And it was a prophetic message and a God message. And if there ever was a time in our world uh, that the kingdom of God needs to be represented by men and women of God uh, who utterly depend upon God and allow God to speak through us uh, to deliver a God word into our world, it's today. Speak to them. Speak that word, Ezekiel, that originates with God and is given to you from God. Speak that word to these bones. And then I see the prophet's call, a call of God there, of course, it's it's, it's so significant. I personally believe, I'm a huge believer in the call of God. I, I, I recognize that every one of us have our story. I told you earlier that our ministry li- literally is anchored to an altar call uh, at Turner Falls years ago. And out of that altar call, the call of God on our lives. Uh, has it always been fun? No. Has it always been easy? No. Has it always made sense? No. But I'm just here to tell you, the call of God will anchor us when nothing else will. I personally am under, under, of the opinion today that the call of God perhaps has never been more important than it is right now in our lives, in our world today. If you're not anchored in the call of God, you may be one of the 38% or that 46%. We've got to anchor in the call of God. And then I see the prophet's voice and I hear the prophet's voice. His voice sounds a lot like God's voice. Uh, I think that's God's plan, by the way, that our voice doesn't need to sound like us. It needs to sound like God. What is God saying? Verse five, this is what the sovereign Lord says. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Here's, here is Ezekiel being called by God to speak to these bones. And here he is, uh, and God is saying, okay, Ezekiel, it is time for you to speak. Have you, ever been, have you ever felt so strongly in your heart? God has given you a word to speak, but have you ever been a, been a bit intimidated by the word that God's put in your heart? <laughs> you say, God, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can pull this off. I I don't know if I can make this happen here. But this is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, put yourself in his shoes, by the way. He's speaking to dry bones. I'm going to put breath into you and make you live again. I'm going to put flesh and muscles on you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. And then you will know that I am the Lord. In my mind, I don't, know if, uh, I don't know if Ezekiel is speaking boldly or if he's just barely getting the words out. But he's declaring the word of God. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I am going to put breath in you and cause you to live again. Don't miss what's happening here. And think about it relative to not just 
what was going on in Ezekiel's day, but think about it relative to your life, your ministry, your world. In the midst of this valley full of lifeless, dead, dry bones, God is setting up a next that will blow your mind. As surely as in the beginning, God spoke light into darkness. And as surely as the resurrection spoke life into death, the prophet Ezekiel is speaking prophetically over these dry bones about God's plans for next that he couldn't even imagine in his own world. And as the prophet of God began to declare the word of God, all of a sudden something powerful began to happen in that valley as God began to give birth to a next that could not even even began to be imagined. It would have scared me to death. All of a sudden, bones began to move. All of a sudden, bones began to rattle. <laughs> you know, Ezekiel may have said, I didn't want to be here in the first place, but I'm not really sure I want to be here right now. But as those bones began to come together, there's a rattling noise across the valley and bones began to come together. And, and, and God began to do the God part of the equation because the man of God had done his part to, and muscles and flesh and skin. I mean, it, it is a, an incredible thing that is happening as God is setting up the next. We can stop right here and be pretty unbelievable. It's a wild and crazy story. People, people, uh, can you imagine the new YouTube videos uh, uh, that could be there and all of the hits on the YouTube just to be able to watch this happen uh, if that were possible. But God wasn't finished and God had more plan and God was getting ready to take next to a whole new level. God has a word for you today. God has a word for you today. God's not finished. God's not finished. I don't know what it looks like in your rearview mirror, or I don't know what it looks like in your window ahead of you, but I can tell you whatever your world looks like today, God is not finished because God is always about next. You need to, you need to reach out and you need to grab a hold of that. God is about next. And then finally, Finally, I want to talk just briefly about the prophet and the supernatural. And I recognize the supernatural is already at work. I mean, bones beginning to rattle and come together and flesh and all of, all of that that's taking place. But I, I want us to think about the supernatural because if you take the supernatural out of this story, we don't have a story. If you take the supernatural out of the story, there is no next the God story has always been and always built, will be a story of the supernatural. How long do we think we can do church without the supernatural? Exactly how much can we really accomplish without the supernatural? Is our best really good enough? I think we have to come to the, just a fresh realization that, that we can't accomplish what God's called us to accomplish apart from the supernatural. Amen. We've got to have the God part of the equation that, that we can't control. We can't buy it. We can't build it. We can't develop it. We can't cultivate it within ourselves. Uh, we need the supernatural. Right. Verse 9, speak a prophetic message to the winds. That's what he's calling Ezekiel to do. Speak a prophetic message message to the wind. Come, O breath, from the four winds and breathe, breathe. I've already said it before, but everything about this has got to be intimidated to, intimidating to the prophet Ezekiel. First of all, he finds himself in a valley full of dry bones. Now those bones have come together and there's flesh, but now he's got dead bodies laying there, lifeless bodies there. And God says, I want you to prophesy again. He says, prophesy to the wind. Come, O breath, from the four winds. Breathe into these dead bodies so they may live again. Listen, God is the God of next. God's the God of next. When the man of God hears the call of God and becomes the voice of God, and makes room for the power of God, there will be a next. Let me say that again. When the woman of God hears the call of God and becomes the voice of God and makes room for the power of God, there will be a next. 
I said when the, when the church of God hears the call of God and becomes the voice of God and makes room for the power of God, there will be a next because God is always about next. Yes. Yes. Prophesy, prophesy to the winds. Can you imagine prophesy? As the Ezekiel, the prophet is prophesying, can you imagine the anticipation in the heavenlies? I can see the archangel Michael jabbing Gabriel and saying, hey, you gotta, don't miss this. Uh, you gotta see what's happening here because God, he can see God setting the stage for something. I think we need to get the sense of what it means for the spirit of God to be hovering over your impossibility, over your disappointment, over your pain, over your tragedy, over the dead end streets, whatever's going on in your life. Uh, Gabriel, don't miss this. Get ready, get ready, get ready because God is about to do something. And so as he spoke, as he commanded, and breath came into their bodies. Breath came into their bodies, and they all came to life and stood up on their feet, a great army. God is always about next. Listen to this as I continue to read in verses 11 through 14. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones represent the people of Israel. They are saying, we have become old, dry bones. All hope is gone. Have you ever said that? All hope is gone. I can't go from here. Nothing good can come out of this. All hope is gone. Our nation is finished. Therefore, prophesy to them and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Oh, my people, I will open your graves of exile and cause you to rise again. Then I'll bring you back to the land of Israel. And when this happens, oh, my people, you will know that I am the Lord. I'll put my spirit in you and you will live again and return home to your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done what I said. Yes, the Lord has spoken. God is the God of next. Amen. I want you to stand with me all across this building this afternoon. I want you to bow your heads just for a moment. I want you to just close your eyes, separate yourself from everything that's going on around you. I want you to think about what, all the, what, what does this really mean to me? What does this mean to you this afternoon? We're going to pray in just a moment. But in order for the next to become reality, there's got to be a man or a woman of God who, who will be re, refused to be detoured by the dilemmas in our lives. We've got, to, we've got to have that tenacious attitude that Brian Jarrett talked to us this morning that will rise up and say, I'm not going to give in to those birds that are going to try to rob me of what God has planned. We've got to acknowledge that he's God. I'm not. I can't fix this. Acknowledge an utter dependence on God. Is it possible that we've become too self-sufficient, too self-dependent? We've got to hear God's voice. We've got to hear God's voice. Hear me in Oklahoma today. We've got to hear God's voice and we've got to become instruments of the prophetic voice of God, the prophetic word of God. What is God wanting to say to us and what is God wanting to say through us? We've got to contend for the supernatural. And as we do this, we're going to see the next that God has planned. And our churches, in our communities, in our state, in our nation will break through the darkness, the chaos, and the church will rise up as a mighty army. God wants to proclaim over you this afternoon, your next is here. Your next is here. You might say, all I can see is a valley full of dry bones. Your next is here. <laughs> you might say, that, it just looks impossible, but God is saying, your next is here. Your next is here. I wanna pray over you. I wanna pray over you as we close this session this afternoon. 
But I want every person in this room right now, your world, your world is a world that, that involves a lot, of, a lot of chaos. So your world is dealing with disappointment to, or in your world, you're, you're struggling. You're struggling internally, emotionally. You're not in a healthy place. You just need God. You need a God intervention. Would you just raise both hands toward heaven this afternoon? Would you just lift your hands toward heaven and say, God, I am utterly dependent upon you, God. I need you to visit me this afternoon in this district council. Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus, uh, the name that is above every name, uh, the name that when we speak that name, demons flee. Uh, We take spiritual authority over the attacks uh, of the enemy this afternoon, God. Uh, God, we need you in this district council. We need you to meet us. Uh, We need you to supernaturally work in our lives, God. Uh, We need an encounter with God, Lord. Uh, We can't replicate what happened to Ezekiel, God, but we need you to meet with us. I pray, God, for every pastor. I pray for every pastor who has been been attacked. They've been criticized. I pray, God, for every situation, Lord, that, 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 that has been divisive. And Lord, the clouds of discouragement, depression, God, I pray, oh God, that you will speak into the darkness of circumstances and let the light of Jesus Christ bring a brand new sunrise as you introduce the next. I pray, God, that at this district council, God, that whether it's in the altar calls or the sermons that are shared, whatever is going on, God, that we will meet with you and that we will leave different than the way we came because the God of next has intersected our lives. God, I speak blessing. Where the enemy has brought about curse, I speak blessing over every pastor, every church, every ministry, every marriage, every household, every circumstance. I pray that the blessing of the Lord that makes rich and he adds no sorrow with it, God would just chase us down. Embrace us, oh God, and cause the next that you have designed for us, God, to be revealed in our lives and in our ministries. And we'll give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Can we just give God a shout of praise this afternoon? God bless you.